This new year, focus on what's truly important to you and let HelloFresh take care of dinner with fresh pre-portioned ingredients and recipes delivered to your door. Get 16 free meals plus three free gifts with code MLM16 at hellofresh.com slash MLM16. Bitcoin Savings and Trust, Pigeon King International, and MMM Russian Ponzi were all incredibly unique and historic scams. Bitcoin Savings and Trust was the first Ponzi scheme to take place using Bitcoin. Pigeon King International was a Ponzi scheme involving the sale of pigeons that rocked the Canadian farming community, and MMM is the biggest Ponzi scheme in Russian history. Today, we're going to be talking about three historic and unique Ponzi schemes, their history and their historic falls from grace. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Multi Little Mondays. I'm the Illuminati, and today is a three for one special. Today, we're gonna be talking about Bitcoin Savings and Trust, MMM Russian Ponzi, and Pigeon King International. I will notate before the episode begins that there is going to be a brief mention of suicide, so if you're not in the headspace to hear about that right now, feel free to skip this episode and we'll see you in the next one. But for now, let's get started with MMM, or MMM, however the hell you pronounce it. In 1991, Russia disassociated from the Soviet Union, leading to a post-communist Russia. At the time, goods such as food were supplied irregularly and inconsistently, and many people in the population would hoard goods and money because of the uncertain availability of them in the future. According to a report by the Association for Consumer Research, at the beginning of 1992, nine out of 10 Russian households also had one member spending at least an hour a day queuing for goods. By the end of 1991, the USSR was in complete financial ruin. By April, 1991, consumer prices, wages, and social expenditures were increased, causing inflation, and most people that had been stock saving due to lack of commodities now saw their savings depleted and an increasing number of people were no longer able to survive on one job as they were before. As savings depleted and more people found themselves in financial ruin, the privatized market economy exploded and so did Ponzi schemes. People were given vouchers that they could invest, sell, or trade for money, roughly $25. Due to the little knowledge of a market economy, many people believed that they would be able to earn money with little to no effort and were unable to see the dangers of a Ponzi scheme. People began using these vouchers to invest in newly privatized companies. Seeing this, scammers began to seize an opportunity to make millions of dollars from people who had nothing and no experience in a market economy. One of these people was Sergei Mavrodi. Mavrodi developed MMM, which has been reported to stand for Mastermind Mavrodi in the early 1990s. Apparently that was, that was the vibe. Originally, it was a venture capital fund. Investopedia defines venture capital funds as a pooled investment funds that manage the money of investors who seek private equity stakes in startups and small to medium-sized enterprises with strong growth potential. Before long in 1994, MMM announced an investment program that promised an annual dividend of 3000%. What that means is that they promised extremely large payouts to their investors. The company used near constant advertisements, previously considered taboo in Russia to get the word out. They also held a giveaway of free Metro trips to the citizens of Moscow. The advertisements played an estimated 30 times a day on television in the homes of thousands of Russian citizens, featured characters that became so beloved they almost became folk heroes themselves. The characters were seen going from being poor and hungry to enjoying the good life, either on a beach, at a bar, or in luxury locations after they invested in the company. For citizens that were currently poor, starving, and had no way to grow financially in the recently privatized Russian economy, the promise for instant riches was certainly an enticing one. The extremely aggressive advertising campaign seemed to pay off. Over 5 million people, and estimates are between five to 10, depending on the source, actually invested in this company. The mistrust in Russian banks, aggressive advertisements, and general disarray of post-communism created the perfect storm, allowing MMM to expand astronomically in an incredibly short period of time. One investor, Natalia, had been saving with Spearbank before investing in MMM. She had grown distrustful of state-run banks after the government withdrew the rubles from circulation and only allowed their citizens to exchange a small amount of money into new notes while the rest of their savings had to stay at most disadvantageous interest rates. After continuously losing portions of her savings to the banks and Russian government, she decided that investing seemed like the best option. 
Unfortunately, despite promising riches, relief, and the good life to investors, MMN was running a classic Ponzi scheme. And simply put, they were taking new investors' money to pay the old with dividends so high it would be impossible to sustain in the long run and eventually fail. Warnings were issued by the president and prime minister that appeared on televisions in 1994. They cautioned people not to invest in MMM. However, since Russian citizens had virtually no trust in the president at this time, the warning went largely unheard and people continued to invest. The company's shares actually reached their peak after those warnings on July 20th, 1994 to over $50. A few days later, the tax police announced that MMM had failed to pay more than $24 million in taxes and fines. One day later on July 29th, the finance ministry released a statement warning that MMM could not afford to pay back investors and were in fact a scam who had illegally issued unregistered securities. Simply put, they had officially been found to have committed fraud. This announcement seemed to finally get the attention of their investors and the stock plummeted from $50 to 45 cents in just four days. From there, chaos ensued. Thousands of people gathered outside the headquarters demanding their money back and attempting to redeem their shares. The rush was so intense that riot troops were sent to the headquarters to deescalate the situation. By the Tuesday after the announcement, the firm officially shut its doors. A spokesperson initially insisted that the shutdown was temporary and blamed it not on the company's inability to pay investors money back, but on bank incompetence. However, other Russian news outlets reported that officials had been caught privately calling the company a pyramid scheme. Despite this, shockingly, many shareholders still believed in the company and actually blamed the Russian government for the chaos. One shareholder said, MMM is the only structure in Russia that isn't deceiving people. He went on to say that the state gives us nothing and MMM has guaranteed that we will live. Others like Natalia were devastated by the crashing stock. According to her nephew, Natalia became hysterical and threatened to commit suicide upon hearing the stock crash. Despite the crash, they didn't officially close down the company. Since Russia did not have any laws about Ponzi schemes at this time, they were even able to issue new share opportunities for investors, which astoundingly, despite the crash and multiple warnings by the government, were met with high demand. Unable to charge him with fraud, the Russian government charged Mavrodi with multiple counts of tax evasion. While incarcerated, citizens developed the MMM shareholders union, attempting to free him by demonstrating for his release. After spending 70 days in jail, he was released on October 12th, 1994, after former employees had collected enough signatures for him to qualify as a candidate in the 109th electoral district. The new Russian constitution protected the freedom of speech of legislators by exempting them from serving jail sentences. And so he ran for parliament, called Duma in Russia, and told his shareholders that if they voted for him, he would be able to give their money back. On October 30th, 1994, his plan actually worked out and he won the election, keeping him out of prison. After his win, he was quoted as saying, if I had lost, I would be threatened by new imprisonment. Now I have new chances to defend the rights of my shareholders, as well as those of other joint stock companies through political methods. Following his election into parliament, he started his own political party, ironically named the Party of People's Capital, but it was barred from elections. Then his parliamentary immunity was stripped by fellow Duma members in 1995. In an attempt to maintain his immunity, he even tried to run for the presidency in 1996, but he was found to be ineligible after it was discovered that his signatures had been forged. Despite his promise to pay back the investors, millions of people never saw a return on their investment, causing them to lose their life savings and fall back into financial ruin. Eventually, Mavrodi was finally able to be convicted of fraud in 2007 and was sentenced to four and a half years in prison, but he was released after a month of conviction, citing time served. But that's not the last we would see of the Russian scam artist. In 2011, he launched MMM 2011, which he made purposely to bring down the global financial system. He was quoted as saying, my goal as a financial apocalypse, the destruction of the global financial system. I consider the current financial system unfair. It's not fair that some people own billions while others have nothing. The system must be destroyed and something else must be put in its place. That's precisely what I'm working on. He described MMM 2011 as a financial social network where citizens gave each other money, openly admitting it was a pyramid scheme. At this point, Ponzi and pyramid schemes were actually still legal under Russian law. The website for MMM 2011 was available in 17 languages and lists phone numbers for a dozen countries. It operated almost entirely online and even accepted Bitcoin. Mavrodi died in 2019 and MMM 2011 was paused, but time will tell what happens in the future of one of the most notorious schemes in Russian history. 
Now, before we go on to talk about the rise of the Pigeon King, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. It's 2022 and single-use plastics are so 1972. Just cleaning our houses results in tons of plastic waste and it's time to go plastic-free with Blue Land. Blue Land has a simple premise. You buy one bottle and refill it forever, so there's nothing to discard. You fill Blue Land's gorgeous bottles with warm water and a Blue Land soap or spray cleaner tablet, and in just a couple minutes, you've got a powerful cleaning product. And they smell good too. You've got scents like lemon and lavender eucalyptus. They've got something for every cleaning need from hand soaps to toilet tablet cleaners. And that one actually sells out quite fast, just FYI. Let me tell you what I love about Blue Land. I've mentioned it before. They're like my new favorite, but when you use their laundry tablets, they're scent free. Big thing for me because I have some skin allergies and some of like the detergents and stuff like that just make my skin crawl. This one doesn't, which is amazing. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash casket. That's 20% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash casket, blueland.com slash casket. Imagine what you could do if you were free from high interest debt. January is a great time to get your finance house in order with Upstart. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan. And you can do it all online and not having to deal with anyone in person, which is probably one of my favorite parts of it all. Rather than only looking at your credit score, Upstart considers other factors as well, like your current employment, income, and your credit history, all to find you a smarter loan rate. Check out rates online without impacting your credit score for loans between $1,000 and $50,000, depending on what you need. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash MLM. That's upstart.com slash MLM. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know that we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information that you provide in your loan application. Make sure you go to upstart.com slash MLM. Alan Galbraith was born in 1947 in Stuffville, Ontario. He came from a family of farmers and had dreamed about becoming a farmer since he was a young boy. And eventually that dream came true. He dropped out of school in the 11th grade because he was disappointed in the teachers and bored. After dropping out of school, he and his older brother, Norman, bought their own farm. It was relatively small, but the two boys raised and slaughtered their own pigs and cattle to sell to markets. They remained successful for over 10 years, but unfortunately in 1980, the farm folded and they declared bankruptcy. With a family to support, Galbraith turned to work at multiple farms and bred and sold exotic animals on the side. It was during this time that he also developed a reputation for one of his favorite pastimes, pigeon racing. According to Galbraith, he had been introduced to the sport in the 1950s as a young kid. He had been doing pigeon racing for fun ever since and was apparently quite successful. Pigeon racing was invented in the early 1800s and had been in Canada for close to 100 years. On the day of a race, birds that had been bred and raised specifically for racing are driven to starting points up to 375 miles away from the finish line. Their trainers release them from various competing lofts and then they find their way back home the fastest way physically possible. The sport has been big in Canada and there are even unions that teach people how to breed and raise pigeons, build pigeon lofts and keep track of race results. Galbraith was so involved in the sport that he was an active member of multiple organizations, including the Canadian Racing Pigeon Union, Canadian National Tripler Union, and the National Birmingham Roller Club. He was also the president of two other organizations, the Saugeen Valley Fur and Feathers Fancier Association. In 2001, after almost 40 years of experience in breeding and racing pigeons, he announced that he had created a new breed of elite pigeon and thus created Pigeon King International to sell them. He ran ads in farming magazines and promoted his new business and began calling himself the Pigeon King while running the business from his basement. When he was first starting out, he would show farmers pictures of Mike Tyson, who had over 2,500 pigeons for pigeon racing and even had a reality show about pigeon racing and claimed that he had sold him his birds. There's no proof that he ever sold pigeons to Tyson, but he used the story to get investors regardless. Investors in Pigeon King International say that when selling his business and the potential of his pigeons, Galbraith never pressured them to invest. In fact, he did quite the opposite. One investor said that he could care less whether you invested or not. Galbraith recommended that potential investors visit people who had already bought pigeons and began the breeding process and wait until they were absolutely satisfied before they invested. While he did not pressure his new investors, he did boast that investors should have absolute trust in him and his business. He even signed a flyer with, he who does not trust is not to be trusted. My business is built with everlasting trust. When the business grew enough for him to get an official office space, he taped that same saying on the front door. Because of this need for absolute trust, Galbraith largely sold to Mennonite and Amish people in Canada. 
He reportedly did this because they were trusting of others and far less likely to go to authorities if they had any problems. Pigeon King International sold the pigeons to farmers so they could continue to breed them. From there, Galbraith promised to buy any of the pigeon's offspring back from the farmers at a fixed price for 10 years and sell them to be used in racing or processing plants to be turned into squab, meat for eating, which he claimed was a fast growing industry. The investors who bought into the business were making thousands of dollars a year selling pigeons back to Galbraith and his business grew very quickly. He hired salespeople and eventually spread the business out of Canada, gaining investors in Pennsylvania and the American Midwest. He even started his own monthly newsletter called The Pigeon Post, which contained pigeon nutrition tips, pigeon trivia, and mazes for kids, and testimonials for investors. At the time, many farmers were suffering because of the low commodity prices, and investing in Pigeon King International seemed like a welcome and necessary way to make money and ease some of the strain associated with running a small farm. One family, several months after meeting Galbraith and listening to his sales pitch, borrowed $125,000 against their farm to buy 360 pairs of pigeons. Another family whose testimonial was featured in the Pigeon Post detailed their lives before investing in Pigeon King International as being full of escalating misfortunes, including one child who was suffering from a brain tumor and another with spina bifida. The family of 10 was living in a house that was falling apart and was looking for something to help afford their growing expenses. At the end of their testimonial, they exclaim, and then came the pigeons, what a blessing. Investors did what they asked and many did due diligence on Pigeon International before investing. One farmer even called multiple government offices and the Better Business Bureau before investing and said that no red flags came up. However, after six years in business, the Pigeon King's empire began to fall when David J. Thornton, a 73 year old in charge of the website Crime Busters Now, committed to taking down pyramids and Ponzi teams began to take notice. Thornton had begun to investigate the business after a Mennonite farmer suggested it was running in an unethical manner. After some investigation, Thornton discovered that Pigeon King International was in fact a scam and he promptly went on the offensive. He showed up to a company open house armed with a megaphone and screamed that it was a scam. This unfortunately didn't do much to stop investors as most people just thought he was crazy. And I mean, you gotta think about it for a moment here. It was a 70 year old man standing out in the cold, shouting into a megaphone that something that was extremely successful at the time was just a scam. I might also hesitate to trust him if I was in those farmers positions too. Since the strategy did not seem to work well, Thornton started in a different direction. He posted negative stories about Pigeon King International on his website, called bankers to spread the word, blacksmiths to get in touch with Amish investors, television stations, and law enforcement. After a few months, bankers started referring potential investors to his website, and he started collecting their phone numbers. However, his strategy was extremely flawed as he asked many of the farmers for money to fund campaigns, making them suspicious of him, his intentions, and his story. One investor even said Thornton sounded like he was on a tirade against anyone and everyone. And another told the New York Times that he sounded slightly unhinged. In the end, his mission to stop Pigeon King International failed because of his inability to promote trust between him, investors, and other farmers. However, in December, 2007, Better Farming released an expose on the company. The expose, which had detailed accounts from pigeon breeders and squab processors and detailed agricultural data exposed the truth that the giant market for pigeons that Galbraith claimed existed wasn't actually there. Farmers who read the expose immediately became skeptical of the company and investments slowed significantly. Galbraith responded to the expose in his newsletter, saying that the editors of the magazine were destructive purveyors of fear. He announced that he was going to be building a processing plant to deliver squab in mass quantities, and the fear mongers and envious critics were trying to destroy his company and were unaware of his plans. Despite his best efforts, Galbraith continued to lose investors and his backlog of pigeons went unsold. Unable to continue on, he declared bankruptcy in 2008. It was then that the scheme truly came to light in the public eye. While Galbraith had promised his investors that the offspring he bought would either be used for racing or squab production, this was a lie. Instead, he would take the pigeons he bought back from his investors and just sell them to new investors. The money he got from reselling the offspring was used to repay the original buyers, making Pigeon King International, you guessed it, a Ponzi scheme. When the company finally folded after eight years of operation, Galbraith was unable to buy back the offspring from investors and they lost on an estimated $20 million. The investigation in the matter took over two years, letting many of the former investors that had been misled by Pigeon King to issue complaints to the investigators and claim they were not taking the matter seriously. Eventually, Galbraith was charged with fraud in December, 2010. Thus began over three years of delays in his trial largely perpetuated by the fact that Galbraith made the risky decision to fire his own lawyer and represent himself in the trial. 
Eventually, his trial began in 2013. Acting as his own lawyer, Galbraith never made an opening statement, never took the stand, and only called one witness in his defense. He brought a visual aid to explain his upbreeding program and tried to explain his plans to build a squab processing plant, but he never figured out how to introduce it into evidence. The jury had to be excused multiple times so that the judge, Justice Taylor, could assist Galbraith to explain to him how to introduce evidence or properly examine a witness. His cross-examinations were riddled with nonsensical questions. And one of his past investors voiced his displeasure by saying, I've got places I gotta be. I've got a thousand things to do at home. And I'm sitting here in a courtroom answering these stupid questions. Galbraith insisted that his business was a legitimate business, not a Ponzi scheme, and that it had been brought down by jealous people trying to attack him and the farming industry. In his closing statement, he told the jury, I am not a lawyer. I am just a farmer and an entrepreneur trying to defend myself against charges, which I believe should have never been brought against me in the first place. However, the prosecution disputed him and told the jury this isn't a mistake. In the end, it only took the jury two days to convict him. In March, 2014, Galbraith was sentenced to seven years in prison at 67 years. Years old. While Galbraith's scheme was being investigated, another emerged. This time it took place with Bitcoin. Trendon Shavers, who went by Pirate40 on his Bitcoin account, created Bitcoin Savings and Trust in 2011. His profile included an avatar pirate with a quote saying, yes, I am a pirate 200 years too late. This is awfully ironic for someone who was perpetuating a Ponzi scheme. Anyway, he first promoted his business by posting on a Bitcoin message board on November 3rd, 2011. He starts out with the post by saying, over the last few months, I have been selling Bitcoin to a group of local people. Now, this isn't a don't ask, don't tell group of people, so I can't tell you exactly where and to whom the coins ultimately end up. But so far, it's been pretty painless. During this last week, I maxed out my available coins both personally and leased from other members, and they needed a lot more. Up until now, I have dealt with my core group of friends and have been able to handle the requests, but they seem to be getting larger and more frequent. So now I am looking into other methods for keeping a consistent storage or on-demand availability of coins. Now, this is already sounding like a Ponzi scheme to me. What is he saying he is unable to support the people he has now, so he needs more investors to support them? It seems pretty obvious, but I digress. He continues on to explain his two plans that he has for those sitting on coins. When you worked with shavers, you had two plan options, on demand or storage. He describes on demand by saying, when an order comes in that is over what I have available, I'll send out a request to users in this plan requesting the total needed. The first to respond gets the deal and the transfer is made. These coins will be tied up for one business day to give me enough time to settle the transaction and acquire the coins in return. Again, some pretty obvious red flags here. Though, if you didn't know a lot about Ponzi schemes or really understand Bitcoin, I could see how you could just miss this altogether. His other plan was a storage plan. He defines this as an ongoing commitment. He goes on to explain the plan by saying, you would send Bitcoins anytime to the address provided and would earn interest on a daily basis. You can withdraw your balance at any time, but I do request that you give me a couple hours to ensure I have coverage for the next order. Interest payments are paid out every three days until either you withdraw the funds or my local dealings dry up and I can no longer be profitable. This plan pays 1% per day. This is where the savings and possible profit came in for investors. Basically, investors in savings and trust would use the service to save their Bitcoin and gain interest, theoretically making money every single week. Before long, people started to invest in Pirate's plans. However, when looking through his business message board on bitcointalk.org, there was some skepticism right from the start. When one person commented on the board on November 5th, 2011, they said, I just lent this guy some Bitcoin. I trust him and I'll respond here when I get my first interest payment in three days. Someone responded by saying, me too. However, I think people will more likely be interested in whether or not we get our principal back. The interest payments would be a secondary consideration. To which Pirate40 Shavers responded by saying, agreed, otherwise it would be one big Ponzi scheme with a smiley face. Shavers was able to keep the Bitcoin savings and trust running for about 10 months before the inevitable happened. He was no longer able to pay off the astounding 7% interest rate per week he was offering his clients, AKA his victims. On August 18th, 2012, Shavers announced that he was closing Bitcoin savings and trust on the Bitcoin message board. He posted, after much consideration, I've decided to close down Bitcoin savings and trust. The decision was based on the general size and overall time required to manage the transactions. As the fund grew, there were longer and longer coin movements, which put a strain on my reserve accounts and ultimately caused delays on withdrawals and inability to fund other orders within my system. 
on the 14th, I made a final attempt to relieve pressure off the system by reducing the rates I offered for deposits. In a perfect world, this would allow me to hold more in reserve outside the system. But instead, it only exponentially increased the among of withdrawals overnight, causing mass panic from many of my lenders. To sum that up, he was unable to afford to pay for the withdrawals from the savings accounts. However, despite saying that there was a strain on his reserve accounts, he went on to say that he would be returning the Bitcoins and interest to anyone that had invested with him. A little over a year later on July 23rd, 2013, the SEC announced that they were charging shavers and BTCST with offering and selling investments in violation of anti-fraud and registration provisions of the securities laws. The SEC accused Shavers of transferring over 150,000 Bitcoins to his personal account. And although he suffered a net loss from his trading, he had gained over $160,000, which he transferred to his personal account to pay for his rent, utilities, and car related expenses, as well as for food and retail purchases and gambling. They also stated that Shavers had misled investors with his posts on the Bitcoin message board saying things like, it's growing, it's growing. I have yet to come close to taking a loss on any deal and the risk is almost zero. The SEC released an investor alert stating, investors should understand that regardless of the type of investment, a promise of high returns with little or no risk is a classic warning sign of fraud. Then on September 22nd, 2014, the final judgment on Shavers and Bitcoin Savings and Trust was released after he pled guilty to securities fraud. The judgment ordered Shavers to pay more than 40 million in disgorgement and prejudgment interest, and also ordered him to pay $150,000 in penalties. The court found that Shavers used new Bitcoins received from BTCST investors to pay purported returns on outstanding investments and diverted BTCST investors' Bitcoins for his personal use. In short, he was running the world's first Bitcoin Ponzi scheme. Less than one month after the final judgment was reached on Shaver's SEC case, he was charged with fraud in New York. Shaver's, who was now 32, had been discovered to have raised over $4 million in his Bitcoin Ponzi scheme. He was also suspected of embezzlement, using the proceeds to buy a BMW, spa treatments, and $1,000 steak dinners for himself. At the time he was charged, he was facing up to 20 years in prison if convicted. At the beginning of his trial, Jason Siebert, his lawyer, had said that the SEC had abused its powers after questioning Shavers for hours, even after he had pleaded guilty in the case. He alleges that the information gathered in that line of questioning was later used in the New York investigation. Siebert said, quote, he, Trendon, did not know that he was answering or why it mattered. The SEC didn't tell him that his answers could be used in a parallel criminal investigation. However, this was unfortunately not enough to save Shavers from a conviction. Remember how he said he was going to pay back everyone's Bitcoin when he closed his business? Well, obviously, if you couldn't guess, he didn't. And prosecutors stated that out of his 100 investors, 48 of them suffered a loss because of the scheme and Shaver's inability to pay them back after Bitcoin savings and trust folded was the result of this new judgment. When handing down his judgment, the judge, Lewis Kaplan, ordered Shavers to pay back $1.23 million in restitution saying, you defrauded innocent people. You did it in the last analysis for personal gain. Shavers was sentenced to one and a half years in prison, substantially lower than the 20 years he was facing originally. Perhaps his apparent regret and apologetic nature for his actions granted him the shorter sentence. Shavers had said in court that he had royally messed up and the business and following legal actions had caused him to lose friends and become an embarrassment to his family. He said, I don't think this is something I'm ever going to get over. So three unique Ponzi schemes, three unique people and thousands of people's financial lives ruined. Two out of the three people discussed in today's episode showed little to no remorse. Mavrati blamed the government, the Pigeon King blamed journalists, and Shavers was the only one to take accountability and remorse for his actions. Not that it excuses him for the record. But with all of that being said, I hope you enjoyed today's three for one Ponzi scheme episode here on Multilevel Mondays. And of course, let me know what you think about it. Sound off in the comment section on YouTube or feel free to reach out on social media via Twitter, Discord, Instagram, wherever, uh, feel free to do that. Let me know what you think. Sometimes there's shorter stories that we come across that we can't cover in a full episode. So we try and do something like this. Let me know what you thought of it. Did you like it? Did you hate it? I'd like to know. But with that being said, thank you so much for spending some of your valuable time here with me today on Multi-Level Mondays and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.